welcome to the self learning platform by dr sushma singh today we start unit 11 jeremy bentham our topic is bentham's political philosophy government cannot be exercised without coercion nor coercion without producing unhappiness bentham said in prakash now unhappiness is to be avoided so the only justification for government is that without it more unhappiness would be produced in society the reason the entire of government is to attach sanctions to certain unhappiness producing actions so that indigenous citizens will not be motivated to perform them or as we said at the end of the previous section the coercion which is by definition part of nature of government is essential to create a system of rights and obligations to further the welfare of society did bentham visualize or construct a pre political state for mankind bentham did contrast political society with natural society defining political society as follows when a member of persons are supposed to be in the habit of paying obedience to a person or an assemblage of person of a known and certain descriptions whom we may call governor or governors such persons all together are said to be in a state of political society when a number of persons are supposed to be in the habit of conversing with each other at the same time that they are not in any such habits as mentioned above they are said to be in a state of natural society was what bentham had to say about the state of nature the state of nature is not an a social or anti social state it is an ongoing society with man in conversation that is in interaction with each other for bentham there was no pure state or nature or political society but there was a continuum between the two governments accordingly in proportion as the habit of obedience is more perfect recede from in proportion as it is less perfect approach to the state of nature the general end of government is the greatest happiness of the greatest number in specific terms the ends of the government are subsistence abundance security and the equality each maximized in so far as it is compatible with the maximization of the rest bentham defined subsistence as the absence of everything leading to the positive physical suffering he advised the government to encourage industrialization to generate employment so that each individual could look after his own subsistence but if an individual was unable to do so the government was to set up a common fund from contributions from the rich for the well-being of the poor if subsistence keeps the citizens from being unhappy abundance is necessary to maximize their happiness by ensuring prosperity that is surplus wealth in the hands of the individuals 
after their basic needs are met. The government encourages the citizens to fulfill all their desires. Bentham thought that an affluence could best be increased by guaranteeing to each man the due reward of his work and security of his possessions. The state should also encourage the inventions of new tools and gadgets and offer rewards for socially useful inventions. It should develop technical manpower and encourage thrift and hard work. Above all, it should fight those aspects of religious thought that encourage man to despise comforts and luxuries. For Bentham, the security had several components. The security of person, of property, of power, of reputation, and of condition of life. By the later, Bentham meant something like social status. Every citizen's security in each of these aspects was to be provided for by the government. Security of property, for instance, is provided by seeking to it that valid contracts are kept by everyone. Bentham was concerned about four kinds of inequality, moral, intellectual, economic, and political. He did not propose any measures to reduce moral and intellectual inequalities, but inequalities of wealth and power were to be mitigated. Differences between the rich and the poor were to be evened out. The more remote from equality are the shares processed by the individual in question in the mass of instruments of felicity. The less is the sum of felicity produced by the sum of those same shares but not at the cost of the security of property. Inequalities of power could be minimized by reducing the amount of power attached to public offices to the barest minimum by declaring even sane adult eligible for them and by making their incumbents accountable to those subject to their power. The last service to the, be provided by the government was that of encouraging benevolence in the citizen body so that every member of the body politic voluntarily and with enjoyment performed the countless small services of which the fabric of the felicity of society was built. The government could, for example, fight the religious and the sectarian prejudices which limit man's sympathies and incline them to treat outsiders as less than fully human. So far, we looked at how the government fulfills its goals in specific ways. What is more important is Bentham's theory of how the government reaches its goals in general. Bentham believed man to be a creature so dependent on others for his well-being that human life would be miserable and even impossible if man did not render various types of services to one another. Society is ultimately only a system of services. Men render one another. Government makes sure of these services by creating a system of obligations and rights. It does this by putting in place a system of offenses with their corresponding punishments. It is a punishable offense 
for example not to pay one's taxes it is a punishable offense to steal someone else's money these punishable offenses ground the services men render each other the positive service or obligation of contributing to the fund of common resources or the negative service or obligation of not interfering with someone's right to property these services or obligations in turn then ground everybody's rights my right to property or my right to subsistence each right only exist because of a corresponding obligation and the government is to be very careful in specifying these obligations my rights may or may not be a source of pleasure to me but the corresponding obligations they impose on others are certain source of pain to them the government therefore should never create rights instruments of fallacy though they are unless it can be absolutely certain that their probable advantages would more than compensate for their certain disadvantages in a political society the sovereign can get the citizens to act as he wants through two ways by influencing their will which bentham calls impersation and by the threat of corporeal punishment which bentham calls contractual although the former power is based on the latter making the later the basis of the sovereign sovereignty bentham points out that a political theory based on imperation is stabler and longer lasting than the society based on contractions how is one of to ensure that the government will create that system of rights and obligation which will best to fulfill the greatest happiness of the greatest number bentham utilitarianism led him to believe that the government that would best serve the people's interest would be the democratic form of government only in such a government could be a harmony between the interest of the governed and those in government be engineered in a democracy what would maximize the happiness of the rulers is to be returned to office and they know that the best chance of this happiness is if they maximize the happiness or in other words look after the welfare and interest of the ruled they know that if they go against the interest of the ruled they will be voted out of office from this argument bentham logically derived the following the right of every adult to vote frequent national elections as frequent as one every year transparency of government business which meant a free press unlimited access to government offices and the right to attend legislative sessions once annual election universal franchise and fullest publicity are established no government bentham thinks would ever dream of pursuing its interest at the cost of that of the community next topic is panopticon the panopticon is the name of bentham gave to model prison 
that he designed for the British government in the 1790s. A piece of land was bought by the government on which Bentham was to supervise the construction of new prison. However, much to Bentham's disappointment around the year 1802, the project fell through. The design of the Panopticon was to serve as a model for any disciplinary institution, not just a jailhouse, but any school, hospital, factory and military barracks could have the same structure as well. The idea of the Panopticon was has become important against today with Foucault's crediting Bantham with creating a new technology of power. The Panopticon represents one central moment in the history of repression, the transition from the inflicting of penalties to the imposition of surveillance. This is how the Foucault describes the architecture of the prison building. A perimeter building in the form of a ring. At the center of this, a tower pursed by large windows opening onto the inner face of the ring. The outer building is divided into cells, each of which transfers the whole thickness of the building. These cells have two windows, one opening onto the inside facing the window of the central tower, the other outer one allowing daylight to pass through the whole cell. All that is then needed is to put an overseer in the tower and place in each of the cell a lunatic, a patient, a convict, a worker or a school boy. The back lighting enables one to pick out from the central tower the little captive sellouts in the rings of the cell. In short, the principle of Dagoon is reversed. Daylight and the overseer's gaze capture the inmate more effectively. The prisoners who have no contact with each other feel as if they are under the constant watch of the guards. There is no need for arms, physical violence, material constraints, just a gaze. An inspecting gaze which each individual under its weight will end by interiorizing to the point that he is in his own overseer. Each individual thus exercising this surveillance over and against himself. To have overthrown the federal or monarchical form of power and replaced it with a new model of modern forms of power is to have brought about a revolution in political theory, even if one is infamous for doing so. Critics of liberalism have often claimed that the relationship between the government and the citizens for liberal theorists almost mirrors the panopticon. Liberalism devalues horizontal links between citizens. What unites a citizen body is that each individual's separate political obligation to obey the government. Although liberalism claims to ground the government in the consent of the governed, this consent is, according to critics, only a mythical or manufactured consent. Fellow liberals who are from the rights 
based tradition of liberalism have also criticized some of the basic tenets of utilitarianism. Kamaika, for example, has pointed out that Bentham was wrong in thinking that the human beings only look for or should only look for pleasure. If an individual could hook himself to a machine which constantly generated sensation of pleasure without having to do anything else that would not satisfy that person. Human beings seek to undertake certain activities for the sake of those activities, not only for the pleasurable sensations they get from doing them. Bentham, like all the other important political thinkers, was a child of his time. It is true that the essential basis of his utilitarian ethics was self-interest egoism and individualism. However, though the community for him was a fictitious body, yet one important purpose of legislation was to enhance the pleasure of others, just not of oneself, which means convergence of private with public interest. Bentham was opposed to any kind of oppression and brutality and he understood that the most important is to begin with reform of the legal system to make it efficient, clear, transparent and simple. His humanism is writ large in all his works and the first major reform that brought in democracy in Britain was the Reform Act of 1832, which was made possible largely due to his untiring efforts. Now let us have summary of the unit. Bentham believed in equality. Each adult was the best judge of his or her interest, and one person's preference were to be given an equal weight as another's. The happiness of the citizens was to be the goal of any government, the greatest happiness of the greatest number. The government could determine the universal interest by beginning with given preferences arriving at the result by computing the pleasurable and pains of different individuals on the same scale. For Bentham's critics, unfortunately, the problem is that a largely laissez-faire economy coupled with new form of disciplining and power in the social sphere seems to lead in the Benthamic scheme of things to the greatest happiness of the greatest number. Here we want to wind up this lecture and we have come to the end of the unit. Thank you so much for your attention.